Hello there. Thank you. Um, my challenge is to explain to you curiosity and creativity in theoretical physics. <laughs> Forget it. <laughs> but perhaps um, let me start by telling you how it is that I became a theoretical physicist, because perhaps it's slightly unusual and may relate to the um, storyteller, the wonderful storyteller we heard earlier this morning. So um, my father gathered a few friends, perhaps, and told me, Gina, I've decided, by the way, my father was not a physicist. He told me, Gina, I want you to become a theoretical physicist. It's a rather unusual message to a son. And, he's, and I said, why, father? Um, Babbo, we used to talk Italian sometimes. And he said, it has the two great advantages in life that I've seemed to have observed. One is um, you can tell right from wrong, which you can't in most things in life. And the other is you don't have to talk to anybody you don't want to talk to, <laughs> which is an even bigger advantage. And he says, in any way, you seem to be good at math, so give it a try. So being a devoted son, um, I decided to become a theoretical physicist. Um, I found out after a while, not very long, that he was wrong on both counts. First of all, you can't necessarily tell right from wrong. And two, you certainly do have to talk to other people. And that, frankly, is just as well. Um, but I enjoyed it. And I find myself, by the time I had discovered he was wrong, I find myself sort of hooked. And I was kind of a curious uh, little boy or big boy. And so I became a theoretical physicist. And I did research as I was introduced and did teaching, trying to inspire curiosity in some of my students. Though I must admit, a few of them were perhaps um, more concerned about getting into medical school than about curiosity, but that's another story, okay? And so I also learned something as I went along, though, which is um, very important, and that is to appreciate it, my particular little branch there, as a craft. And this is something which is true for a carpenter, a school teacher, or Signe in her beautiful drawings. Um, there's a craft, and it takes patience, and it takes hard work, um, it takes attention, and it's rewarding. It's rewarding to gather those skills. They can be mathematical, or as we say, they can be just building or communicating with people. And those skills are very enjoyable and precious. So now let me illustrate this, being a theoretical physicist. Um, the theoretical physicist union said you have to give a little story about Einstein. So um, I'll tell you about Einstein's curiosity. And this is a, something he's recorded as saying in November of 1907. He was 28 years old. And he still worked in the Baron Patent Office. He had not yet become famous. He was already great, of course, and he had already discovered the special theory of relativity, but people didn't yet recognize him. So he still had his little office, and he worked there. And he said, I was sitting in my chair one day, and I suddenly realized that if a person is in free fall, that means just falling through space, um, the most famous Example now is the vomit comet, you know, where you go in this airplane at, in free fall. It says, when you're falling freely, you do not experience the force of gravity. You don't feel gravity at all. And then he says, this was the happiest thought of my life. All right. And it led him to his great masterpiece, the general theory of relativity. But that took him eight years of hard work, of learning the tools, perfecting the tools. And finally, when he came out with it in 1915, it was perfect. It was beautiful and perfect and polished. And he used it to calculate a little um, deviance of the, the, the orbit of Mercury. 
that had been known to astronomers for 100 years and was not explained by Newtonian gravity. So he used his theory, and it explained it. And his biographer then, uh, a famous professor at the Institute for Advanced Studies, said, Einstein was beside himself. He couldn't work. He had heart palpitations. He says, I think when he realizes this was the greatest experience of Einstein's um, scientific life, and he said, perhaps the greatest moment in his life altogether. Um, so that's my Einstein story. <laughs> but that idea of learning something, of having a sudden idea, and then of following it up, um, is a profound one. And we see it in children. And think back on your own lives. I remember, for instance, the first time uh, my father, the one who told me to be a theoretical physicist, took me and I had um, on a bicycle and I had gone on a two-wheeler and he tried me on um, something with no side wheels to ride a two-wheel bicycle. And suddenly I could do it. And that was this great revelation for me. It was a moment of freedom, of excitement, of learning a new, uh, having a new experience. And then, of course, I learned to ride a bicycle better or the first times you start to read. Um, these are great moments in your life where you have both something exciting, curious, and then a craft. It doesn't always work out all that well, so um, perhaps I'll tell you a story from my own life as a scientist. Big stars, they live a few billion years and then they run out of this nuclear fuel, and then they begin to collapse. And they collapse as they go through various stages. And the final collapse is precipitous. Um, there's a big explosion. It's called a supernova. And it lasts only a few seconds. So in that last few seconds of life of a supernova, of a star that will become a supernova, something happens to them. And they get this tremendous kick and they start moving in some direction at about 500 miles a second. So you're talking about something about as, with the mass of the sun moving at 500 miles a second all of a sudden in some direction. So I remember working on this problem and suddenly I thought, aha, I have, I found the answer. And that was one of the, um, and I remember walking then in the evening in my neighborhood and looking out at the trees and so on and thinking, I'm the only person in the world who knows how this happens. And um, it was a wonderful moment. I was wrong. <laughs> um, not that I was the only person in the world. The idea was wrong. Um, so you go up, and then you go down. And then you pick yourself up, and you go and see if you can do something with it. So with these ideas, you have to, um, you have to take the ups and the downs, and enjoy the craft, and see what you can do. Um, it's a wonderful experience to do that. I remember reading, there's um, the great cartoonist and writer, James Thurber. He had a book of what he called Thurber's Fables. And one of the fables says, um, it's about moths and what they do at night. There's this large group of moths. And in the evening, a light bulb goes on. So most of the moths, or all of the moths, they fly toward the light bulb because they're attracted by light. So they touch the light bulb, they get singed, and they die. But there's one who looks out at a star, and every night, the moth heads out for that star, and then the star disappears, and the moth flies back. And then Thurber always ends these stories with a fable. In this case, the fable, um, the, uh, the moral, actually. And the moral is, uh, I think, who flies far from this, our sphere of sorrow, is here today and here tomorrow. I don't recommend this as a moral. 
but I do recommend um, sticking with things, sticking with um, the things that uh, inspire you either to make the world more beautiful, more attractive, or to make the world better, to help other people, to uh, make the condition of life better. I remember, you know, I've gone to being a professor at, you know, at, up the street at Penn for a long time. I've gone to my share of graduations, including those of children and so on. And I find myself um, forgetting all those graduation speeches, you know. Now you all go forward into this world. You are the, you know, so promising. You have the world in front of you, blah, 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 blah. Uh, and funny, in a way, the only one I remember was given by um, McNeil, Jim McNeil of the McNeil Lehrer Report. And instead of saying that, he basically said to those smiling um, pen faces out there, he says, um, some of the dumbest people I know have gone to some of the best colleges. <laughs> and he said, um, why were they dumb? Because they graduated and they never opened a book again. They never had a thought of their own. They just followed, you know, everybody else. They never, they weren't curious about anything. That's what I call being dumb. Um, and McNeil, by the way, who went to a small college in rural Texas, has also written 12 novels. Um, eight plays, uh, a variety of things, and that's aside from his day job. So my moral is stay curious uh, and do something with it and keep working. Thank you very much.